So I mentioned earlier around the um, middle management role, and it, it struck us uh, when we were working with organizations, again, we work with a lot of safety sensitive type industries, and um, you know, many organizations, and I come from one of them, Union Pacific Railroad, that's very proud of their safety record. They do a tremendous job at safety and also addressing employee health, but it wasn't always that way. And working with Union Pacific and other organizations, we saw that there was, there was this kind of continuum that organizations went through when you really looked at best of class organizations related to safety. And so you had senior management expressing vocally that, hey, safety is important here. And then you had senior management committing actions and, and modeling and demonstrating the importance of addressing corporate safety. Maybe it was, you know, the CEO or the superintendent or someone high up in the organization went out to a shop, made sure they had all the PPE, protective personal equipment on, you know, demonstrated safety, made sure everything was was correct in the environment so there was no trip hazards and things like that. So they started to show that and demonstrate that. And then they started setting standards saying, you know, productivity, operations, outcomes are important, but safety is number one. And they started driving that home to mill management. And again, mill management, they're really busy, they'll do whatever they're asked to do. They're asked to address employee safety, guess what? They'll address employee safety. They're asked to raise their operations numbers or their production numbers, guess what? They'll do whatever it takes to do that. And if, sa if it's not clear that safety is not number one, then safety isn't going to be number one because they're middle management for a reason. They're there because they get things done. So they're going to do what they're being asked to do. And if it's addressed operations versus safety, they're going to do that. On the other hand, if senior management comes and says safety is primary, operations is second, then it's like, get the message, now we're gonna address safety within the organization. So then middle management cascades that message down to their direct report saying safety is number one here. And then middle management gets measured on safety, incident accountability system. Then the employees begin to embrace the message. And I've seen this a lot in organizations. It goes from safety is our responsibility or some, you know, some uh, semblance of that to internalizing it where safety is my responsibility. And just that one change from our to my can make a tremendous difference because now I'm not just worried about your safety, but it's my safety first. So the reason why I share this with you, and there's an article in your folder about it, is when you think about health within your organization, and I'll go back, where do you think health stands on this seven continuum scale? Anybody? Anybody want to share or guess? I'll give you my opinion. I think we're somewhere around uh, three to four. And so I, share, I say that to you because think about where we have to go next as, as an industry, you know, as a, as a discipline to start to really internalize this among middle management and our employees. And we have a model right here. We have a great model with safety. Now we need to take the lessons from that and apply that into the, the health improvement initiatives that we have within their organizations. This is just an example of when we talk about health and productivity, um, health within a middle management rank, what would be some of the topics that we would want them to understand? One is that connection, one is their role, uh, one would be understanding the touch points that exist, being a role model, again, not being the perfect role model, but just showing participation challenges, uh, sharing the health improvement vision, goal setting within their, their, within their direct reports. Those are just some of the things. And what we found was when we train middle management on these topical areas, they have never really thought about it before, right? Many times, frontline supervisors will say, yeah, my health is important, but I never really thought about that it's my role to address my direct reports. So we find by giving them the tools and the resources and helping them understand, then they feel more confident with themselves, just like we all do, right? You need that level of confidence before you talk about a specific topic, especially to your, to your fellow employees. Now they feel like they have some resources and some um, uh, ammunition that they can take and say, yeah, this is important within the organization. And as your, as your boss, as your frontline supervisor, I just want to share with you 
how I feel about you participating or addressing employ uh, your personal health or whatever it might be. Oh, and by the way, this really goes along with how the company views it as well, just like you would with safety. And again, with safety, many times you did have these, these trainings taking place, many times with mill management, helping them understand that importance, that context, and being able to internalize that message so that then they could uh, cascade that to their, to their employee population. So I mentioned earlier about these universal skills that if we all possessed that, um, that we could help each other with behavior change or with relationships or finances or becoming a better family or community or whatever it might be. And think about these, that if we worked through these uh, principles of understanding and we practiced these with each other, that we really could be support for one another, whatever it is that we're trying to do. And so it's not trying to make people health experts or make them health coaches. It's just saying we want to create that supportive network among people to be able to work together. And the reason why I mention this is because when you start to cr create that support network, that influences what? The culture, the norms, values, beliefs, attitudes, the support that we have for one another. Does, does anybody know where the term mentor comes from? Mentor, um, there was a, a, a king in ancient Greece, and uh, he was, you know, his military was fighting another military, and his military was losing. And he had to leave his kingdom to go out and lead his troops. And his son, his, his, his um, right-hand person, his name was Mentor. And he said to his, you know, his servant, he said, I'm going off to battle, you have to raise my son. And the son, I think he was seven at the time or whatever, came up to Mentor and said, how are you going to raise me? And Mentor's response was, I never raised a son, we're going to do it together. And that's where the term mentor comes from. It doesn't mean that I'm better than you or I know more than you, it's we're going to work together at this. So if we possess these universal skills and these universal goals of what we want to accomplish, right, then we work together to, to make sure that that happens. So here's story number three. Has anybody read this book, Guns, Germs, and Steel? Dr. Uh, Dr. Diamond, he's an um, anthropologist, I believe, at UCLA. But anyway, he does a lot of work uh, around the world, and he, he's basically trying to s see how human si societies came about. Right, and so he goes to New Guinea a lot. You know, one of the home of really worse society, uh, uh, human formed, and he has a good friend over there, and uh, he relies on this person uh, tremendously when he's in New Guinea, and he tells the story of the, in this book where he went over there and his friend was so excited to see him, and he comes running up to him at one visit and he says, "Doctor Diamond, I had a major revelation," and he's like, w w "What is it?" And he goes. I finally decided that there's something wrong with our people. That when I look at our society and I compare it to what's going on around the world, we got to be an inferior race here in New Guinea. We just haven't advanced as much as the other societies around the world. So it's got to be something personal. It's got to be within us. And this really bothered Dr. Diamond. And so he has a quote in there, and hopefully you can see the relevance. But I just think it's so powerful. He says, history followed different courses for different peoples because of differences among people's environments, not because of biological differences among people themselves. So we all know of an organization that is extremely profitable. People love to work there, right? And they have low retention. They have high recruitment rates. And that could be down the block across the street, uh, same industry, it could be another company where they're going out of business or people can't wait to get out of there or everybody's looking for jobs or they have you know, a high turnover rate. And it's not the people, they're drawn from the same labor pool, right? It's that environment, it's that culture, it's the, it's the climate, it's the organizational support that's being created within those organizations, that's the difference, not necessarily the people that are making up those organizations. So just a few other uh, closing comments. One is, we often think about, so when I say to you, what is a healthy, what is a safe culture, right? Or you go into an organization and you say, I look around and I say, so this is a safe work environment, right? You have low incident rates, 
and we look at the prevalence of safety incidents, and it's very low. What are some of those characteristics that we see within those organizations? Well, one thing is employees see anywhere from eight to 10 positive safety messages a day. So ask that on the health side. Do people see positive health messages eight to 10 throughout the day? We definitely see enough negative messages, right? In all the media and all the uh, things that we see online, we see all the negative health messages. But think about within work, home, community, are people seeing positive health messages? Um, and also, do the plant policies, procedures, or organization, are they in line with creating that positive, healthy environment? So the senior management mention safety. Do they mention health periodically through company communications? Do they talk about how it's family, health, the organization? Is that message being shared periodically that health is important here? Uh, do management at all levels communicate, uh, participate in the healthy environment? And is the target population, is it engaged in programs according to their health interests and needs? So just to, to wrap up and tell you one last story here, um, we know we know from the research that has been done throughout this industry that if you have this integrated health management model and you identify the internal, external stakeholders, you take account for all of those determinants that make up our individual health status, and maybe you don't have a designed intervention for each one of them, but it's recognized, it's measured, it's accounted for, and you look at all the other aspects of health, that you're definitely gonna be significantly more successful with your program, sustaining it, behavior changes, positive cost outcomes, than you are with a single department, a single program. And that's not to criticize any organization or anybody that's doing that, it's just simply stating a fact that you're just limiting your effectiveness by that kind of model. We know that when we go to organizations and we identify the burden of illness costs, we say, we wanna help you identify the cost of poor health within the organization. We haven't yet done that where we go present the numbers and senior management says, mm, not, not, not enough. You know, they're always surprised in the opposite direction. I call it sticker shock in the opposite direction. They're like, there's no way it could be that high. Well, it is that high and this is probably, or we know that this is less than it is because we don't want to overstate the case. So we often point out three, four, five different things that we built into those numbers to show that a conservative estimate. So now we're not getting on the defensive saying, show us a return on investment for your program. I gave you X thousands of dollars and you've been doing this for a year. Show me that return on investment. Now we're saying, look, this is the cost of poor health within the organization. When you're faced with this magnitude of a problem, this magnitude of an opportunity within the organization, how much do you as a senior management team invest to try to offset or take advantage of, of that lost opportunity. Changes the discussion, changes the argument. You can still get to the return on investment and, and you want to, but it starts to help management understand that there's more to this than just providing some money, here's time one, here's time two, what's the return on investment? Because when organizations do it in that model, what they end up with is oftentimes being highly criticized, reduced resources, and continued skepticism around it, even though they're trying to answer the question, they haven't backed up and really looked at it from a, uh, a total health standpoint. And we know that when we look at the uh, VOI, when we take into account these other factors other than cost, and if anybody wants that listing, I should have brought it, but I'd be happy to share it with you. Uh, when you take a look at all these other factors besides cost, that it really helps tell the whole story around the importance of addressing employee health. And then throughout, hopefully you see the, um, how culture and the work environment fits into all this. So here, here's my last story. In, um, in 1980, I uh, graduated high school and I went into the Navy. And I went to uh, Naples, Italy. And I was there for 40 months. And the good Lord looked down on me and said, you know, I can't have that schmuck go out to sea. He'll, he'll, kill, he'll get killed. So he put me on shore duty, which is very nice of him. And so when I was in Naples, I went to the University of Maryland European Division. And being in Italy, you know, I wanted to learn about the culture. I tried to learn the language and so on. 
And one afternoon, there was this workshop on mafia. And I thought, gosh, how fitting, you know, to hear, learn about the mafia and being here and going down to Sicily and some of the areas and so on. And so it was, it was a very informative, educational, just a great seminar for the weekend. But I'll never forget, 4 o'clock on Sunday, the professor said something to me that I'll never forget. And he said, I know we've been talking about mafia and we've been talking about this organization for two days now. He goes, I just want to tell you, mafia is not an organization. People are like, what? He goes, mafia is a state of mind. And now think about today, you know, we can substitute whatever word you want to put in there, terrorist, dissatisfaction. It's that state of mind that drives behaviors. So I say that to you because think about the state of mind, the, what you want to do within your work home community to start to influence in a positive way health practices of people that are close to you or people that you work with. Because we can think about a program Right, But we know that when people stop referring to it as a program and they just say that this is how we address safety here, this is how we address health here, these are the norms that we operate in within this environment, that now it's no longer a program. It's just the way we operate. It's that state of mind that we have that health is always important here. We always do what we can to address it, and it's going to be at the forefront uh, and the topic of, of what we do and what we talk about every day. So with that, I'll end. Thanks for your time. I appreciate the invitation.